Well, amen. Good evening. Welcome to Recharge. Glad that you are here. Uh, glad that we are back on Wednesday nights. I get a lot of good comments on Wednesday nights that uh, it is their favorite sermon for me because it's the shortest sermon for me. And uh, to that end, that's what happens on, there we go, there's my, there's my, my cheering crowd. You want me to go longer, that's what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, let's just go all night, all right. Uh, <coughs> uh, so we just sang about the fact that Jesus is Lord of all. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're going to be starting a new Wednesday night during a recharge uh, series where we're going to look at what Jesus demands of the world, what Jesus demands from us. Uh, I'm going to be using a primary resource, uh, a, a book written by John Piper uh, with that exact title, What Jesus Demands from the World. Um, so turn with me, if you have a Bible, into John chapter 3. John chapter 3, and the first one we're going to look at is that Jesus demands, what he demands of us is that we must be born again. So a lot of you are probably familiar with this scene. Uh, it's, it's, it's been preached often. This is, this is the scene where we get uh, the most familiar passage in the whole of the Bible, John 3, 16. But John chapter 3 opens up. It is the evening. Jesus is at home. And a Pharisee named Nicodemus comes and knocks on Jesus' door for a conversation. That conversation goes like this. It's, it, it, Nicodemus is, is a, a ruler. Uh, he, he is well known. He is a, a leader in the community. And he shows up at Jesus' door in recognizable Pharisee garb and, and says, Jesus, we know that you are from God because no one could could." Uh, perform these miracles and, and be doing the signs that you are doing. You have been sent from God. And in verse 3, Jesus, like, no, no sugarcoating, no uh, uh, pleasantries, just looks right at him and says, truly, truly, I say to you that unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, how can this be? This is like, you, you, you can't be born when he is old. How could he enter a second time into his mother's womb? And then Jesus repeats the statement. Truly, truly, I say to you that unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, put those verses on the screen, if you would, Rhonda. What I, want you to, what I want you to notice there, th those statements are identical uh, with the switching out of uh, being born again, unless one is born again. And then in the second time, he says the identical statement, he says, born of water and the spirit. So in the first sentence, it's born again. In the second sentence, that same thing, what it means to be born again, is redescribed as water and the Spirit. Now, oftentimes this leads to some confusion of interpretation. Uh, there, there are those that think that water means ambiotic fluid, uh, born of the natural from the mother's womb, that Jesus is saying you must be born of water that comes out of a woman and then again in the spirit. Uh, it, the, the major problem with that is, is that uh, there's absolutely uh, no evidence of, of speaking this way in the ancient world. That sort of phraseology did not exist in the ancient world to use uh, birth of water, meaning natural birth. Um, and I've just showed you there, like the phrase is one in this one, and then it's two in this one. This also is not a reference to baptism. Uh, there are some that teach that. Um, now, this is closer to the meaning. Baptism is closer to the meaning because baptism represents this. 
Okay, this does not represent baptism. The salvation doesn't come at baptism. Baptism actually represents this. No, in fact, as Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he tells him, like, you should know this. You are a teacher of the law. What is Jesus referring to? Well, there is one time in the entirety of the Old Testament where water and spirit are linked intricately in a statement, and that is in Ezekiel 36. So check it out. It's on the screen. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. This is in the context of the promise of there is a new covenant that is coming, okay? I don't have time to unpack Ezekiel, but this context is, hey, a new covenant is coming, and then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean, and I will cleanse you from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So when Jesus chastises naked, you're a teacher of the law and you do not know that I am telling you, you must be born of water and spirit. Jesus is making direct reference to this passage because this passage was talking about the new covenant, the new promise that was coming. Now let's reset our scene. With this understanding, we're talking about you must be born again because I want you to see how radical this is. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Okay, first of all, he's Jewish. He's of the right stock of people and bloodline. Secondly, he is the elite. He is in church all the time. More church than you could ever imagine. Okay, he fasts twice a week. He tithes of everything that he knows. He prays extensively. He has memorized the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch, okay? He has more Bible knowledge, more church, more everything. Than you. And on top of that, he is a, a teacher, and he's a leader of the teachers. He is a Pharisee. In addition to that, he also has the right theology. The Pharisees are correct. The Sadducees aren't in the fact that there is a resurrection. Additionally, he sees and he recognizes that Jesus is from God, sent from God, and should be addressed as a teacher and should be listened to. Nicodemus has all of those things in his favor. And Jesus looks at him and says, you got to be born again. You must be born again spiritually because everyone is born of flesh and in your flesh, you're dead because you've sinned and you've fallen short of the glory of God. And so there must be a moment when you are born again. Now, everyone is in this camp this is without exclusion, okay? The reason Nicodemus is used is because he outworks all of us. So if Jesus says that to him, right, you're not more churchy or better than Nicodemus. So where does that leave you? You must be born again without exception, because you've sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because you're spiritually dead. And unless the Spirit of God comes and revives you, resuscitates you, gives you resurrection in the depth of your soul, you're separated from God and you will stay that way. You can't go to heaven. So the question to all of us, right? Have you been born again? You say, how? How do I do that? Well, he goes on and he gives an illustration in verses 14 and 15. This is out of Numbers chapter 21. I'll 
quickly describe the scenario, Israel had repeatedly uh, run away from God, been disobedient, and God sent uh, serpents to come and bite them, and people were dying. It was a consequence of their sin. And uh, because of that, Moses cries out to God, and God says, build a giant pole, a standard, a giant pole, and put a giant bronze serpent on top of that, hold it up, and when the people look at that bronze serpent, they will be healed. That's an odd little story. But Jesus here says, listen, that's how you're born again. Not by looking at a bronze serpent, but by understanding that that story pointed to me. How? Because every one of us have sinned and have the due consequence of that sin is death, separation from God. You will be separated from him for eternity. To say the word hell is so taboo in our culture, but it's the reality of the Bible. It's why Jesus came. And the moment that you realize you have no righteousness in yourself, right? This is Nicodemus. You are not better than Nicodemus. And Jesus says, you must be born again. And so the moment that you realize you can't do it yourself, but God has lifted his own son up on a standard, on a cross, and made him your cursed sin, the moment that you look to him in full recognition that he has finished the work for me. It has all been accomplished on the cross. And he says there in verse 15, and believe you're born again. Spiritually reborn. And And the Bible teaches that process, that faith, all of that is a work of the Spirit in you. Puts his spirit inside of you, and you're born again. And to resist that, to harden your heart, and to turn and rebel and run the other way from such good news that he would do this to his son so that you might be forgiven, so that you might be born again, so that you might know him and walk with him. That's some of the other good stuff we're going to get to, okay? But... But to resist that, at the end of the day, the scripture says you will stand before him and you will hear, but you've hardened your heart. Why did you not have faith? I came for you. I, I, I did all of this for you. Why did you reject? You, you are left in your sin. You must be born again. So I pray, if you're under the sound of my voice this evening, that you know that you know that there's a point when you have been born again, spiritually reborn. That's why we're here. That's why we sing, because he's, he's changed us and he's given us hearts, right? He ripped out that heart of stone and inserted a heart of flesh that beats for him. And we rejoice to sing for him. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, that his demand of us is that we would be born again, spiritually reborn, and and for everyone to remember and to know that they have placed their faith in you, in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, to look at you and to believe. God, give them that assurance, that knowledge right now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you guys. We'll do this every week at Recharge. Continue to walk through these. Uh, Now we break up into our classes, adult discipleship classes there. Uh, Choir goes into this, uh, the back room here and practices for Sunday. The list of those classes are on the screen if you don't know which one you're going to yet.